there are several ways to calculate derivatives without using limits, or maybe even to define the notion of the derivative without limits. Sometimes this is called automatic differentiation, and it often uses the ideas of infinitesimals, some sort of like extension of the real numbers. Well, today I saw another way of getting at this idea of finding the derivative without using a limit or kind of defining a derivative without a limit. So it comes from the two-year college math journal, an article from 1980. So let's recall the maybe proper definition of the derivative, maybe pre-defining it via a limit. So given a function f, we'll let f prime of a, so the derivative of f at a, to be equal to the slope of the tangent to the curve y equals f of x at the point a comma f of a. And so observe that the way that we define this will kind of naturally lead to our limit definition of the derivative. If you just think about taking a secant line, which has a slope that's very easy to calculate, and then limiting that secant line. But let's notice that if we have, well, a derivative for a certain function, we can find the equation of the tangent line. So that's the right-hand side over here. That's the equation of the tangent line, f prime of a times x minus a plus f of a. And then, well, what do we know? Well, we know that the tangent line and the original curve will intersect exactly once in a region that is near x equals a. So in other words, this equation right here has exactly one solution near x equals a. Now, what I'd like to do is take this right here, this statement, this exactly one solution of intersection and see if we can reverse that into the definition of the derivative. So let's see, let's say if we found some number m so that f of x equals m times x minus a plus f of a has exactly one solution near x equals a, then I'm going to claim that much of the time this m will necessarily be the derivative. Now, well, notice right here, this is just the equation of a line of a slope m through the point a comma f of a. Okay, so anyway, I guess maybe let's look at some examples where, yes, you can actually calculate the derivative using this kind of reversal definition, if you will. And then we'll also look at an example where you can't and then maybe finish it all off with a a quick discussion of maybe what are some conditions that might have to occur on a function so that these are equivalent ideas over here. Okay, so for our first example, let's take f of x to be equal to x squared, and we'll take our point a to be the point 3. And so let's uh, just use the fact that we know what the derivative here should be. So the derivative of x squared is 2 times x. If we plug in 3, we get 2 times 3, or 6. So we should have f prime of 3 equals 6. Okay, so let's maybe see if we can use this kind of reversal idea of the definition of the derivative to retrieve that number 6 without ever, like, taking a derivative. Okay, so here's our goal we want to find some number m so that this function f of x, which is x squared, is equal to, let's see, m times x minus three plus, well, f of three, or, or in other words, nine, has one solution. And I guess I should say one solution near x equals 3, but we'll see that that doesn't really matter in this case. Okay, so, we'll, so let's push some things around here and observe that this equation is equivalent to the following equation, which is quadratic in x. Well, it's already quadratic in x, but I'm going to move some things around. I'll have x squared minus m times x and then plus 3m minus 9 equals 0 has one solution. Okay, great. 
So in other words, uh, the M chosen so that this has one solution is equivalent to the M chosen so that this new equation has one solution. But this has one solution if and only if the discriminant equals zero. And well, let's recall that we know how to find the discriminant of a quadratic equation. That's really easy. So for example, for the quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, then what we need here is d, which is b squared minus 4ac to be equal to zero. Okay, so well, what is that in our case? So that's going to be m squared, so really minus m squared, and then uh, minus 4 times a, but a is 1 here, times c, but that's 3m minus 9 equals 0. So that would be the condition that the discriminant equals 0. But now we can expand this out and we get m squared minus 12m plus 36 equals 0. But then we can factor that as m minus 6 equals 0. Sorry, m minus 6 squared equals 0. But that immediately implies that m must be equal to 6. So it seems like, yes, at least at the point 3, we can find the derivative of f of x equals x squared at, well, at the point 3 using this method. This method where we simply impose the condition that m must satisfy the rule that this equation up here has one solution. Okay, let's look at another example. Okay, so for our next example, we'll take the function to be f of x equals the square root of x, and we'll take our point to be a equals 1. Now, we know that the derivative of this function at 1 is 1 half, just by using the power rule. So let's see if we can find an m so that this equation, the square root of x equals m times x minus 1 plus 1 has one solution near x equals 1. And, well, let's see if this m value coincides with the derivative like it maybe should based off of this statement down here. And, well, like it did for our previous example. Okay. So how can we solve this equation right here? Well, I think maybe the standard strategy here would be to square both sides. So let's do that. So that's gonna give us an x on the left-hand side, and then on the right-hand side, we'll have mx minus m plus one quantity squared. But now we can multiply that out. It's not too hard, and what you'll get is the following you'll have mx squared minus m squared plus one. That comes from like just squaring each individual term. And then we'll also have minus two m squared x. And then after that, minus two m, and then finally plus two mx. That comes from all possible cross terms, which can be achieved each two different ways. That's why they're attached by a two. Okay, so we want this to have exactly one solution near x equals one. Okay, so now we can move some things around here and note that we get the following. So we'll have something like this. Oh, this should have been an m squared here. So we'll have m squared x squared, and then plus minus 2m squared plus 2m minus 1 times x, and then plus m squared plus 1 equals 0. So that's the equation that we get now. That's just from reordering these terms that we have just above, and we want this to have one solution. Great. So let's see how we could solve this. Well, notice that's another quadratic equation in x, so we might as well look at the discriminant again. So the discriminant in this case, so it'll be b squared, so that's going to be minus 2m squared plus 2m minus 1 quantity squared minus uh, 4 times a times c. So that's going to be 4 times m squared times m squared plus 1 you get that equals zero.
Now again, you can multiply out this first term, and after multiplying out this first term, you can collect all of the like terms, and then, well, in the end, multiply by minus one, and that'll bring you to 4m cubed minus 4m squared, and then plus 4m, and then minus one equals zero. Okay, great. So, well, we should hope that m equals one half is a root of this polynomial. Because, well, we know that m equals one half would make this way of calculating the derivative coincide with the actual derivative. And then, well, if we try to enforce our guess that m equals one half is a root of this polynomial, then we should be able to divide this polynomial pretty easily by 2m minus 1. And in fact, you can do that. And that'll give you 2m minus 1 times uh, 2m squared minus 2m and then plus 1. Great. And so now obviously we'll get three solutions here. We'll get the solution when 2m minus 1 equals 0. In other words, when m is a half. And we'll get the solution where these, or where this quadratic polynomial is 0. But let's quickly take this quadratic polynomial and look at its discriminant. So again, that's going to be b squared, so that's 4, minus 4 times a times c, that's minus 8, but that's less than 0 but that means it has no real solutions. Okay, but then since it has no real solutions, then that number cannot maybe give us a slope of a line up here. So the m equals one half is the only one that really makes sense in the context of being of slope of a line. But notice that m equals one half does coincide with this derivative as we know it. Okay, now let's maybe look at one more non-example. And what I mean by that is an example where this doesn't quite work. Okay, so we're going to end this with a couple of more examples. So our first example is f of x is sine x at a equals 0. So we know that the derivative is cosine evaluated at 0 is 1. And we also know that sine of 0 is 0. So that means in the end, for this like kind of condition down here, we want to find some number m so that sine of x equals m times x has only one solution near x equals zero. Now, I think maybe this is like a little bit trickier or perhaps impossible to find the derivative using maybe this imposition of our condition here because observe that if m is bigger than or equal to one, then, well, here I've got in magenta the graph of the line y equals mx, and then in this peach color the graph of the sine function, and observe that regardless the value of m, as long as it's bigger than or equal to 1, you have only one solution there. And of course, maybe this graph doesn't prove it, but I think you could probably prove that for any value of m bigger than or equal to 1, you get exactly one solution. Okay, well, what if m is less than 1? Well, if m is less than 1, then, well, if you keep your definition of near to between negative pi and pi, then you get three solutions. Now, you could argue that you'd like to go in tighter there, and you'd also only get one solution. Like, look, if here we went in maybe to this point, which would be like pi over 3 and negative pi over 3, then you would only have one solution. Now, any way you look at this, you know, reversing this thing that comes out of the definition of the derivative definitely does not properly define the derivative in this sine of x case, at least when you're at zero. Now, why doesn't it define it there? Well, I think it probably has something to do with the fact that this point, x equals zero, is also an inflection point for the sine function. I have a guess that if you're away from an inflection point, this idea will work. Now, could you always analytically solve for the value of m that makes you know, this condition hold? I'm not sure that that's the case, and that's illustrated by, by the following example. 
So if we've got f of x equals e to the x, and we've got our point to be a equals zero, well, we know that the derivative should be equal to one. And that's because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, e to the zero is one. Now, we'd like to impose the condition that we'd like to find an m so that e to the x equals m times x minus one plus one has one solution near x equals zero. Now, I think since we are away from an inflection point, a change in curvature, this is probably doable, but also probably kind of tricky. Maybe I'll leave it to you as like kind of an open-ended question um, as, did I get this condition about the being away from an inflection point right? And also maybe a less open-ended uh, question that's a little bit easier to solve, can we show that the only value of m that makes this condition hold is one. And that's a good place to stop.